All right, uh, we're going to take a look at the next module. This is Candel Core. We're going to look at uh, the one, the second page of the 131M110 module, the thermostat applications for heating systems. And in the first uh, series, we had looked at the uh, locations and some of the, the specific areas to avoid and, and locations and things like that. Uh, we're going to look at, um, and we also talked about the anticipator and specifically what was trying to be done with the anticipator uh, for the system. So um, specifically, you know, we learned that the, the, the anticipators are really are the differential adjustment and specific to, you know, we'll look later on, you know, how do you set them up and do some of those things. So in this portion, we're going to look at uh, some of the other areas um, to address. So first thing uh, is um, the cycle rate. And as, um, which we know, um, there are different styles of anticipators. So in the, the, the thermostats that I had issued or, or uh, had indicated, the, the TA-12C and the T87, those are just two examples of thermostats. There are many other ones that utilize these, these anticipators. Well, when you get into electronic thermostats, then they go away from these, what we call, let's call them a, a, an actual anticipator to more of a, let's call it an electronic anticipator where they're, they're using electronics to adjust the rate and then that becomes more of a cycle rate adjustment of the system is primarily what they're doing. So that's really what's kind of happening uh, to some extent on there. So when we, we look at it, um, what I did was I took a little snippet out of the, I took a little snippet out of the, um, one of the manuals of one of the thermosets. And, um, and the, the funny thing about this particular thermoset that we're gonna be looking at is this is one that um, I had a, recently had a family member that had just bought a thermostat and they wanted to put it on, you know, they wanted to put on the wall and it was the exact style that is shown right here. And it was one that they had bought um, through one of these focus and energy programs um, is what was interesting. So those particular, let's call them, rate cycle rate adjustments or cycle rate type uh, type deals are are set up in this way and I wanted to point that out on this particular one how uh, we're showing the cycle rate adjustment um, and this is defined in this way so let's go ahead and, and dig into this one a little bit more so there are a set of dip switches on some of these new thermostats that are, some of them I should say and some of the new thermostats where they'll have a couple of dip switches and this one is saying use dip switches number one and number two to set the heat cycle rate. So take a look at table one. So specifically the cycle rate is they're, they're identifying well how many times per hour do you want the system to be cycling to turn on and off. And so for example what they're showing me in a what they're showing me in a uh, in like a steam or a gravity system, something that's a very basic system, um, maybe not the highest efficiency of systems, but they're those types of systems. They are expecting roughly about one cycle per hour. Now, so they're saying if I want one cycle per hour to take dip switches number one and two and adjust those. So. In the back side of the thermostat, that would mean that there is this particular switch number two and switch number one. Those two are what you're adjusting. So you're saying, all right, let's put them both, both uh, one and two on. Now, what that's going to do is get, it's going to give you the largest swing. So I'm going to put on here that um, it's going to, what I'll just put on here is it offers the largest differential is what it does. So that's the largest of the differentials. Now, of course, 
um, what that's going to do is it's going to minimize the amount of times that that control valve or that boiler or that furnace is allowed to, let's call it, enable or to try to heat up or warm up. Um, now, it's not going to prevent a customer from getting heat, but it's they're, they're attempting to try to limit the amount of times that it's going to turn on and off. Let's take a look at the next one. So the high efficiency warm air system is, uh, is the next one that they put in here. So they're calling that either you know, a hot water system, a heat pump, um, anything like that, but a high efficiency system. Typically the cycle rate for most of those systems is approximately about three times per hour is normally. So if you put that into context, that means that it, let's just say, whoops, whoa, what happened there? Well, let's see what happens here. Let's go back to that. Hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, so um, that's not supposed to happen. So the next thing is, um, so that's adjusting that cycle rate. Now specifically what I want to hit up on is this. So in this particular case where we're saying we're gonna, we want to have three cycles per hour, which is really typical for a, a heating system, that means it's going to, what I'm going to put on there is to turn on, whoa, what is going on here? That means it's going to turn, it turns on and off, I would say only once per, let's say, you know, if it takes 60 minutes in an hour and you want to cycle it three times as a, as a typical cycle rate, that's basically saying 20 minutes um, is roughly. Now, again, it, it is a, it's kind of a, your typical guide, you know, turns on and off once only uh, per 20 minutes. So that's kind of the idea on there. So is, and, and you know, you really have to kind of ask yourself, you know, is three times an hour, four times an hour going to be too much? And I would say probably not. Four times an hour, you'd have it once every 15 minutes that you'd allow the system to kind of function. And it's a guideline. So what they're specifically saying is, okay, now dip switch number one, you're gonna put that in the off position, and dip switch number two, you're gonna put that in the on position. When you look at a gas or an oil warm air, so these are gonna be a higher, um, a system that would maybe have a, a much warmer or a, a uh, probably more heat generated, as an example. Um, then we're gonna have zip, dip switches one and two are gonna be both off. And that's gonna give you roughly about six cycles per hour. So that means once every 10 minutes, that system's gonna be kicking on and off. Now, I think that's actually a little bit much, um, that's a little bit maybe too much cycling in a lot of cases. But they're, I think they're looking at it from, you know, maybe the, the possibility that maybe some of these systems are, are, are you know, maybe they feel the need for them to cycle more. Um, I personally would not. I would be looking at, let's say, even an oil, a forced air oil furnace. I would actually rather leave it at the three cycles per hour and not the six, simply because I would rather have the longer run time. However, um, just to minimize sooting. But if it's a, you know, what they're, the trend that I'm seeing here is, a, is that particular system, they're suggesting that to be uh, six cycles per hour. So that's, I'm just trying to put that into context. Now let's take a look at an electric warm air furnace. Now an electric furnace, you can run an electric furnace and you could cycle that as darn near as much as you possibly want to. So they're saying, you know, nine times an hour roughly. So that's, you know, dip switch one on, dip switch two off is gonna give you nine times an hour. Now, an electric warm air furnace, what you're doing is you're basically just uh, enabling a fan to turn on every time you have a heating demand, and you're going to enable or disable, let's call it heating uh, contactors. 
And those contactors are going to be what they're using to turn the heat on and off to, to do the electric resistance heating. So that's probably the norm for those things. So here's what I want to point out to you. So let's take and use this to our advantage. So let's say that I happen to have a system that is, let's call it, is, is cycling more than I want it. So, uh, and I've had systems that have been like this in the field. So um, if you've got a, 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 let's say, a furnace that is very oversized, as an example, as an, uh, an oversized furnace, and what happens is every time that you turn that unit on for the application, so let's say you've got a load in a building of, let's say, 20, 30, 40,000 BTUs, but you've got a 100,000 BTU furnace. Now, what will happen is that unit will kick on, all the ignition controls, everything is going to operate, and it's going to enable, you know, turn on the gas valve, it's going to heat everything up, but it's going to do it so fast that in a minute or two or, you know, two, three minutes, you're already, you're about ready to shut off. And at that point, it's barely really had enough runtime to, you know, it had enough runtime to warm it, but it doesn't do a very good job at controlling temp. You'll get these swings a little bit. Now, what'll, so what, the problem with that is it's super difficult and it's super hard on the controls. So what'll happen is the controls themselves will, let's say, you know, the inducer motor and the igniter and the ignition system and every bit of the heating controls what it's doing is it's going to it's going to cycle them more than what it really should be doing and that's the problem with that so if you um, it'll it'll lead to premature failure of a lot of those components so think about it if you have a furnace a forced air furnace that really should only be cycling at three times an hour and you set it up for let's say a cycle rate of six or eight or nine times an hour that's potentially nine times an hour that the igniter turns on. So that would mean it would shorten the lifespan by literally a third of what it would normally be potentially. So that's the problem with that. So what I typically have tended to do is on applications where I have an oversized furnace is I oftentimes would, would, would adjust and set the cycle rate to a lower number in an oversized application regardless of what they're telling me the system is intended for and I would do that intentionally because that's my only way to control the differential and if um, without changing the furnace. So an oversized furnace, set it to a typical cycle rate that's a little bit lower than maybe what you would anticipate in, uh, on a lot of, of your applications. Again, that's really your setting, and that's what it's doing. It's doing the same type of a setup as the, let's call it as the, the the anticipator that we had talked about in the previous um, lecture you know so the anticipator was you know that adjustment on here you're setting the length of the cycle to some extent is what you're doing so going back further to this that's your cycle rate now i want to show you another uh, another style so i ran um, into another furnace uh, thermostat that i typically would see in the field and um, for example, one of these, or this next one, is, uh, and we've seen numerous of these things. And one of the complaints that sometimes people have is, you know, similar. They'll say, oh, you know, it seems like it shuts off, turns on and off too much. Or it, it uh, you know, and most of the time, you know, they'll say, gosh, it's got such big swings. Or, you know, there's a number of ways that a customer might describe what's happening. You have to kind of recognize that the the cycle rate would um, is your only adjustment on something like this so that's kind of the one of those so where what do you get to do so the way this one works is on this particular thermostat they're showing me two screws on that on that a and b now this is again this is a little bit of an older thermostat but i'm showing you this for the sake of the the usage and what they did so what they're showing you is saying, all right, for a 90% or greater furnace, um, so that would be our typical high efficiency furnace in our climate, they're saying adjust screw A out one turn and screw B in. So that primarily is what they're saying, this is what we feel is gonna give us the normal cycle rate of a 90% efficient furnace. Now, if you, 
look at it, then they also differentiate for an electric furnace. So they're saying, all right, if the, um, for the longer, if you want a longer on length, you know, and longer on time. So that would mean a bigger differential is what that would primarily mean. So I'll circle that even on here. So for a longer on time, that would be a larger, and I'll make a note of that, and that is a larger differential. So for a larger differential, they're saying, um, you know, adjust, readjust screws A and B to match this system. So they're saying, all right, for a warm air furnace is what they're doing. So what you're gonna notice on here is for a warm air furnace, they're, what they're doing, um, yeah, for a lar yeah, for a, a warm air furnace, they're saying turn A, turn screw A in and screw B in. And for an electric furnace, they're saying A in and B out one turn. These are the ways they're programming these, they're the internals. We don't have any control other than those are our adjustments that we have to learn to make. Now, thank goodness that they've kind of gone away from a, a thermostat like that or design like that. Um, in, um, in some of the newer thermostats that are a little bit more modern, for example, like a T4, um, Honeywell T4 Pro, or there's a number of different companies that make uh, similar types. What you're going to do is you're programming the number of cycles. So you, it's a matter of uh, when you get to that in the programming parameters, you're going to either dial it up or you're going to dial it down. You're going to adjust this number of ci the cycle rate, um, whether it's you know whether you want more or less and that's primarily how you're doing that that's your only adjustment screw that they're giving you so and what happens is there's a set of wires that the screws make contact with so when they're saying turn them in one adjustment or one turn in or one turn out what they're doing is when they're saying screw it in they're saying make contact when they're saying screw it out they're saying T take away the contact. So just by loosening it up, that's what you're really doing on there. So it'd be, it would do the same as if you actually remove the screw. But of course, um, you don't really want to do that is what they're doing. Um, another uh, little area that um, I want to hit up on, which is relevant, very relevant in this, is um, on this, this little circuit here, this thermostat, it didn't do a very good job showing it, but that wasn't the intent of that illustration. Down in here, though, I do want to hit something up on this. Is on this particular one, I want to I want to make point or make note of this fuel switch of F and E. Now, this is a on some of the other thermosets, and I've had people um, have had this issue before when they, you know, you might have a customer that'll go down to the local, you know, retail center and they will buy a thermoset and try to install it, but they don't know what any of this stuff is They're a lot of times. So they might go through the instructions, but they may not necessarily see um, the correct way to do this. So what I want to hit up on there, that little F and E switch is, um, the reason for that is it, it literally controls the, um, the fan, let's call it the fan cycling um, with the heat demand. Now I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So when you set it, setting the stat uh, for, let's call it the E position, which is electric heat. I'll, I'll just make a note, electric heat. When you're setting that stat for the E for electric heat, the expectation um, really is that the fan cycles with the let's call it with uh, with the heat demand so um, what I really mean by that is every time you enable or give it a heating call um, you're going to um, every time there's a heating demand the fan you're gonna get an output on the thermostat to energize the fan is what you're gonna do. Now, normally that's 
that's what that's what setting it to E is going to be. So that literally means so you have a heating demand. There's no waiting. There's no delay. There's nothing. The fan will turn on immediately the second that you give it that heating call. So on that W output, that if that's my heating demand output, the first thing is they're going to do is they're going to say, okay, W is going to be powered and the G will also be powered. So essentially, when it's uh, I'm going to circle, actually, I'll make a note on here. So what will happen is this, whoops, same thing, give it again here. Let's switch it to there. There we go. So setting it to E, you're going to have the W get energized if it's depending on the system. And you'll also have the G that will get powered as well when it's set to E. So any heating call, you're going to get power output out of those two terminals. Now, a, when you have it set for the F terminal, that that is going to not necessarily control that. So in other words, what will happen is, is we're going to say the T stat, whoops, I did that again here. Let's go back to this. All right. So when it's set to the F, um, well, I'm just going to put a note on here. I'll just say T stat um, does not control the fan. And so that's primarily what is going on there. So um, I'll just say during a heat demand. And it's important to recognize that there's a difference between heating and cooling demands. But this is a, a parameter that when you on these some of these other furnaces and these other thermosets electronically that I mean, that we've had for years, um, oftentimes they had a switch that was identifying either electric or or F is fossil fuel is what they're trying to do, and um, that was actually having a direct in you know a direct uh, response to to how the system was going to respond to a heating demand, and a lot of customers that would go and buy their own thermostat and put it on there and they just figure, well, there's electricity going to the furnace, so it must be electric. And um, of course, not everybody did that, but that was an issue. And uh, so it, it was one of those things where if I gave it a heating call and the fan turned on immediately, I pretty much knew right away that that's what was going on in there. So that was kind of one of the things to, to recognize with that. So that's a little bit on that. And again, uh, on these newer on the brand new thermostats and the newer, higher um, technology type thermostats, that's a lot of these features that you are doing with screws and dip switches. Um, a lot of the newer ones, because of you know the advancement of electronics, they have they've gotten to the point now where they will program it. So the as it's a menu driven system where you're they're asking you, well, how many cycles do you want, and you're adjusting it that way and um, and then they might say the system type and what's going to control the fan. And that's what they're going to be asking you. So that's kind of a, so those questions are taken care of. And you'll, when you do this as a lab activity, you'll know exactly what I mean by that or installing your a thermostat and, and doing the programming. All right. So let's, uh, let's continue on with, um, with one. And there was one other, um, there was one other thing that I wanted to also make mention of here. And I'm going to, I'm going to hit this one up here specifically. So when again, when you have a cycle rate, in this case, I'm circling the nine, and I, I just want to point that out on here. So that cycle rate that that we are that we're dealing with here, that cycle rate. I'm mean, just going to say on here, it yields. What I'm going to say is that it basically yields a uh, lower a lower differential is what it does. So that's important for you to recognize um, that a customer that wants a little bit tighter control, then you're going to be adjusting those differentials. So the more cycle rate gives you a lower differential, and uh, and obviously you know we'll just say tighter control. But there is a downside to that. The downside of that is when you do have that and you set the differential that high, um, you cycle your every one of your controls, every one of your relays, every one of those systems, 
is turning on and off that many more times. So it's, it's, it's very relevant to recognize the, what that's doing. All right, let's go into the next one. And the next one here is, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, another anticipator on, on applications, and that's called the cooling anticipator. Now, the cooling anticipator, the first thing I would, would um, identify on here is this is normally a fixed, um, basically, whoops, a fixed resistor, fixed resistance device. There is no, um, whoops, device. It is a, it's a fixed resistance. There is no adjustability um, on this, on these, so no, no adjustment. So the way they're doing this is they have a little anticipator or a little resistor that's going to create some heat to kind of, let's call it, simulate the heating of the space. Now, it's kind of one of those where um, it, I think they have fairly minimal impact, and um, so it's, it's a fairly minor type of a, of a deal, but a lot of these, a lot of your furnaces, a lot of your um, uh, thermosets would indeed have an anticipator. So for example, like the round Honeywell T87, um, there was a sub base on here that we used um, that I'm gonna show you this one here. So this little sub base that is shown here, right there, that sub base. That sub base contains the anticipator and it's fixed into the sub base and it's a little resistor that indeed will will show um, that will indeed have some impact in the cooling cycle. So let's go ahead and and talk about when that's specifically in the circuit. So the the anticipator is actually uh, surprisingly enough the anticipator is not in the circuit. There we go. The the um, it's actually in the circuit. Um, during the off cycle is where, that's when it's in the circuit. So the, the challenge with this is that, and I, I've never seen one of these that have been burned up. I'm sure it's probably possible, but, um, but I, you know, it's, it's in the circuit while it's really, while there really isn't a demand. Um, so part of the issue that you run into is that, you know, if, ever, if any one of those ever burned up, how would you ever know it? And I don't know that you would. Um, I think it would be super challenging to, to have that on there. So let's talk about the adjustment and, you know, the differential. So what adjustment is there? Well, if it's not adjustable, there isn't any. There is no adjustment. Um, the only way that I would say um, would be unless you have a programmable cycle rate um, adjustment is what I would say. As long, you know, if you've got a cycle rate um, adjustment, so this would adjust the, what I'm gonna say is the uh, cycles per hour in the programming. Um, and this would be typically in the programming. This is also identified, I'm gonna list this as CPH. So that's the other uh, way that you normally would see this. So when you're doing programming on a regular programmable thermostat, that is one of the things that you typically are doing. Normally, you know, just it's very similar to the heating side. A, a typical cycle rate um, per hour would be, you know, somewhere in that, let's say three to four times um, per hour would be fairly normal and very customary. Um, three to four cycles per hour or times per hour, um, I would say is very normal. So that's, that's kind of the typical. Again, most people don't mess with it a uh, heck of a lot. I think if you have, uh, you know, on the settings like that where you're dealing with, you know, um, a system that you know, I, I think three to four times an hour is more than adequate for most jobs and most cooling systems, I, I do not anticipate that that would be a, a problem any other way on there. And that would apply in heat pump as, as well. So it's roughly three to four times per hour. All right, so let's take a look at the next one here, on item number four. So item number four on the module, it talks about identify industry standards 
for thermostat wiring and installation. Now, this is kind of these, one of these funny things here is that, you know, what, you know, some people say, well, geez, you know, what standards do they have in there? And, you know, typically, you know, I think some of the standards that we have is most contractors are going to have, you know, spools of wire that are going to have, uh, you know, a certain gauge wire. Maybe, maybe it's an 18 gauge wire, but yet you can certainly go to, you know, a home improvement store. A customer could go to a home improvement store and literally put in, you know, smaller wire. Um, they could, you know, they could be putting in, they could, they might sell them a 22 gauge wire, which is, you know, very, very thin. Uh, it might be fine for a phone connection, but it's maybe not the best when it comes to our other connections, so our other, um, our other applications. So that's kind of the one thing that I would say. So let's take a look at, at um, talking specifically about, about how many conductors would be the minimum. And that's where I'm going to kind of handle this. So I'll, I'll probably talk a little bit about as we do this um, about, you know, the minimum number. So the minimum number of uh, conductors. So we're talking about essential the wires, you know, how many numbers of wires. All right, so if I've got a heating only system, the typically um, the, the standard in the industry is you're gonna need a minimum of two wires. Now, the two terminals that you typically would be using would be R um, and terminal W is your normal heating only application. Now, there, this is just kind of the norm. Now, there are many applications where they don't use R and W. They might use like a T1 and T2, or they could use something like that, but that's the bare minimum. Now keep in mind, in every single one of these that we're gonna be going through, you might not have, you know, you're not getting any extras or any additional ones. Now, if it's an electric furnace, then obviously, uh, such as the next one, so I want, you know, heating with fan operation. Well, then, you know, I'm looking at a minimum uh, three wires is what I'm going to need. And in those particular cases, that means I have R, I'm going to have W, and I'm also going to need terminal G. Now, in, in all of these, you know, these that I'm describing to you, um, there is no provision in this, in any of these for a common, which I'm going to talk about that coming up. So what about heating and cooling? What about a heating and cooling system? So three wires um, so we look, let's look at what we need for, for heating and cooling. So typically, the, the bare minimum that you're going to need is four wires. And um, let me identify what those are. So obviously, R is going to be one, W, I'm going to need G. But when I want to do the cooling, then I'm going to need the Y terminal as well. Now, those are, that is the bare bones minimum um, that you can possibly have in there. So that's kind of, kind of one of those. So let's talk a little bit about the need for a common. All right. There are many thermostats that we use in our industry, and some are, some have a common, have a common wire connection or a common terminal. Other ones won't have a common terminal. So you have to, um, you know, you've got to kind of know a little bit of what does the thermostat need uh, for that. So. I'm gonna, so the note that I'm gonna make on here for this is I would say, you know, it depends um, on the thermostat. It depends on the thermostat. If it's a programmable electronic thermostat um, that is battery operated, you may be able to get away without having a common. Um, and, th but there again, it depends on, on how you wanna handle it. The one, the one thing I would say on this is when you're running those conductors and the customer thinks they're going to put an electronic stat, I would say always pull um, an extra conductor. So it's an extra wire. Um, and, that, and I say that simply for we want to assume that there will be a need um, for the common um, common connection on the stat. So you gotta be really careful with that. 
um, in, in all of these situations. The, the way I would, I would always, I, I would rather have an extra conductor for whatever, you know, whatever reason it might be on there. And I would always, the other thing that I would also say is always, um, I would say always, always, always use the, the common, use the common wire um, to operate, um, to operate the thermostat, to operate the power, um, I would say to the stat. Um, always, always, always that when you can. So now they make, they make thermostats that are called power stealing stats. And I'm going to put a note on here that some, some power stealing um, stats I'm just going to say they operate with or without um, the common conductor. Now, what the world are we, what do we mean by, what do we mean by that? All right, so what a, what a power stealing thermostat does is usually these are electronic thermostats that may or may not be battery operated that will have, what they're doing is they're actually feeding power through the circuit. So in other words, you would have, you would still use your R connection. You would have a W connection. The W connection would, would actually be trickling a certain amount of power, even though there isn't a heating demand, it would circle some of the power through that connection um, back into the furnace in order for it to operate. And these are thermostats that notoriously uh, have been uh, just a little bit troublesome um, because they're, they tend to have some issues. Now, it depends on the unit as well. So if, like I said, if you have a system that, let's say the load doesn't, isn't big enough. In other words, if the heating circuit doesn't pull enough current draw through the circuit during a heating demand, that can also lead to some problems with it. So a lot of these power stealing thermostats, um, we got to be really kind of careful with on those because they can they can just be uh, um, they can be just a doozy with nuisance issues. Um, I've had some applications, uh, um, not to 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 uh, point out any one particular uh, brand, but um, I've had some some. Uh, people that I know of that have put in some of these Nest thermostats and some of the Honeywell thermostats, and they're all good quality thermostats, but the way they can operate with or without uh, a common. And when they do that, all of a sudden uh, we would, out of the blue, all of a sudden the fan would turn on on the furnaces. And uh, and it was, it was just a very erratic operation. So... <clears throat> You have to be really careful with that. All right, the next one. What about running extra conductors? Um, so when we are running extra conductors, uh, the, I, I kind of have a, a rule that I typically usually will consider. And I, I just say always, uh, you know, run an extra conductor. Now, um, when possible. Now, here's the... Here's, the reality. Some of this depends on where you're running it. <clears throat> if you're running a thermostat in a second level, you know, and you and you're just going to be a, it's only going to be a heating only or a cooling only or something like that, and you only need two wires. R by all means, you know, run whether it's a three or a four, because you don't know what's going to happen in the future as far as how that might work. So, granted, you can always go wireless. They make wireless thermostats, but it would be, you know, there's, again, now you're talking added cost for that customer. So a lot of contractors will, will try to run, you know, they might have a standard, but we don't run less than a five conductor, or if you have two wires that are needed to maybe go to an AC unit um, to run the contactor, we'll run a, an 18.3. Again, a little bit of this depends on, on specifically what you are 
you know, how difficult it's going to be to change the wire. Um, if it's an easy, easy change to, then it's not, a, it's probably not as big of a deal, but it, it's a big deal when it's very challenging to, to run them, not to mention time later on. So that's kind of the one way. So, <clears throat> all right. So let's take a look at um, the next one, item B on here. Now, securing the wire to the studs or the joists. So this is one of these where that can be a little bit challenging. And the thing that, that, I, that I look at it, I'm not a big one on running wire staples at all um, without, any, you know, without any issue. I'm not a big one on there. So staples, um, I know of guys in the field that, you know, 30 years ago that would take these metal staples and they would staple the thermostat wire and it was, it was pinching the heck out of the insulation out of the wire. And all of a sudden, you know, you'd be, you would go to the service call on, a, on an older unit and uh, maybe somebody tugged on the wire or eventually what happens is the insulation would break down. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you've got a fried transformer or you've got a heating system that's running nonstop because, you know, depending on which of the wires are shorted out. So I, I always, I'm a little leery on that. Um, I would just say use um, only as appropriate, whoops. Use only as appropriate staples on there. Um, so I've had applications where I would just take and, you know, tape the wires. Or if I'm going to put, uh, if I ever have to pull those wires or pull a new wire, I don't want to have it where, you know, you've got a, a, an inch and a half nail or a one inch nail in a staple that if I have to pull a wire, it's not coming out. That staple will not break. So it's one of those where I'm a little bit, uh, you know, I'm a little bit, uh, it's, it's a challenging ordeal to be in. The big thing that I, would, that I would always say is, you know, think about, think about the replacement. What if you have to replace that wire? And that's kind of one of those that, that you have to, to consider. Um, this one is one that I'm gonna, I'll hit up on a little bit on here. Now, I've had this happen on applications where, I'm gonna draw a little picture here. So here's a, a stud, and I'll say this is the, let's call it that, the sill plate on here, the base plate. And let's say that, you know, I'll put another stud in here, and this is my wall, the wall cavity. Now, I've had this happen where where you'll get a, a, a contractor that will drill a hole in that base plate, they'll run this wire through that hole, and they decide that, well, we're gonna mount the thermostat in this stud. So they'll drill a stud through there, and then all of a sudden they'll drill a hole there, run the thermostat in here, and then all of a sudden there's my T-stat. Now, the problem with that is nobody will ever be able to change that wire because of the way they ran that wire. So one of the things that, you know, your best solution or the best, you know, objective or way to do this is certainly going to be to, to run the wire up in the same cavity that you're going to be hooking it to. So this right here, in my opinion, that should not be done in, in those cases. So to, to switch it from cavity to cavity, um, certainly not when it's, when it's even possible to change those wires out. Um, if there's a problem or if there's something that changes in the conductor. Now, again, there are, there are situations where in those cases like that, a customer can always go wireless, um, but again, it just adds some additional costs on the job if, um, if that is the case. So anyways, let's take a look at the next one. Now let's talk about wire colors and then um, we'll talk about wire colors and then we'll look at a couple other uh, applications here. So now, first thing on wire colors. Now, Again, um, there really, surprisingly enough, there are, whoops, there, there really are no hard rules um, on wire colors. And, um, and you can kind of tell that for those of you guys that do work in the field already and you do some install, you might recognize that you can go buy two different spools of wire that are of 18.4 or 18.5 gauge and the colors of the wires aren't the same. And that's kind of one of those where um, then you, you just deal with what you have. So I'm going to give you what I would say is the norm or the typical, um, but don't be surprised if 
you go on a job and it's not exactly what you might be thinking. So first thing that I'm going to hit up on is, <clears throat> excuse me, RH. So the first thing in RH is this is certainly going to be um, the heating. You know, that anytime that's, it, and I'm going to say it's the heating uh, 24 um, volt or VAC circuit is really what it is, um, as you guys uh, should know already by now. And uh, normally, the typical wire color that we would usually use is that is going to be a red conductor. Now, that's probably the one that's the most. Now, you'll notice that by the R in there. But what about dual transformer systems or where you might have, uh, you could have, you know, two different colors of wires that we might be having to deal with? Well, if you've got the same conductor that's going from one unit to another unit um, or a same wire in there, you might have two red wires. Um, that because they ran two different spools or you could have it where there might be um, they might have pulled a, an orange wire or they might have pulled a different conductor that you know they figured out what, what am I going to use so this is this one's a little bit more of a challenge on that so I'm going to put this one first thing I'm going to identify it is this is the cooling 24 VAC um, circuit now on a system where you might have an oil furnace they, you will very much likely have a heating circuit 24 system and you will also have a cooling 24 volt transformer system. There it might even be applications where a heat pump may even have its own transformer. So there are, there are different applications out there that would be done that way. Normally, if you know, I try to go by the rule of, you know, I'll try to make that a red conductor, but it's, you're gonna use what's available to you in those cases. All right, let's take a look at the, at the G circuit. The, the G circuit um, typically has been identified as the fan circuit, so as a general rule. And the fan circuit um, typically has been what I would say is your, is your green um, conductor, your green, the green wire. So we're talking about the coatings on these wires. Um, that's normally the case on there. So let's take a look at the next one, so your W1 circuit. So your W1, I'm going to identify it as your stage one heating, is what I would say. It's stage one heating. And typically, we usually would associate stage one heating as the white conductor, is normally what, what we would say. So usually we'll use that as the white one um, for obvious reasons on that. So let's take a look at the next one here. Um, this one I'm going to say is the heating... Um, We'll say stage two. Now, if you have a W3, and I don't list it here, but if you had a W3, that would be heating stage three. And um, so this heating stage two, um, a lot of times, again, this is going to be that available conductor. Um, a lot of times people end up using the orange conductor. And again, if, if you look at a spool that has, you know, whether it's a six or eight conductor, um, you're going to probably... Uh, you'll notice that you'll, you'll get the typicals, the, the red, the green, the white. You might have blues and yellows and oranges, and you, you try to pick what's available. So I'm just giving you kind of the typicals on here. So let's call it an orange wire. All right. And, of course, Y1. Now, I typically, in the past, I would have probably called this one as uh, cooling stage one. But... Um, it's probably not accurate to do that anymore. Um, in fact, uh, the you know the more you know up in our northern climates, you know we are dealing more with heat pumps than we've ever done before. And the big thing to recognize that this is um, I would I would identify this as um, stage one compressor. Um, I would say stage one compressor operation. Is the way I would um, the, the way I would identify that, and that stage one compressor operation, um, I would say, you know, typically, you know, if you had a, set, a standard air conditioner, that's certainly going to be just cooling only, but stage one, um, in this case, you know, a lot of times we'll use this as the yellow conductor, um, but instead of like I said, the point I wanted to make on this one is why one we think of as stage one compressor operation. And, um, and normally that would either be yellow wire, which is oftentimes what we, we, we would oftentimes use. Now, 
in, as you can imagine, um, the next one is going to be stage two, um, stage two compressor operation um, is the next one. And that, of course, um, would oftentimes um, end up being a blue. Now, part of why I've had it happen on spools of wire where I didn't have a yellow wire. They gave me a blue wire. They basically give you a red, a white, a blue, and a green. Um, but if you often, I would say more often than not, you'll typically have a yellow conductor over a blue wire. And the blue conductor, um, when you get into the bigger spools, that blue conductor may be one of those that will that uh, we usually, and again, you know, you, you refer to it as the blue as being cold or second stage or another stage of capacity. So, and again, that's, that's the tip, typical what we would see. Let's take a look at, at item number, at, uh, the next one is uh, the C or the common, and specifically um, the common, um, I'm gonna say the common connection um, 24 VAC. So now you have to be careful with this um, on, <clears throat> excuse me, the one thing that you really absolutely have to consider and you have to be aware of with this common con uh, conductor and the common connection is you gotta figure out whether, you gotta figure out whether the, um, what common connection is gonna need to be, to be shown on here. So for example, if you've got a, a thermostat is requiring a common and you're dealing with a two transformer system, you have to make sure that you identify or the, look in the manual to find out which common are you going to use. So for example, if you happen to have, if you've got, to have, if you've got an RC and an RH in your system and then you have a C, you need to figure out whether they want to use the common for the cooling circuit or if they want to use the common for the heating circuit. Now, I would say more often than not, I typically would run, um, I typically would see the common for the cooling circuit as the more, the more typical. Um, but it, again, it, it depends on how they're doing that. If they may say, um, you need to use, the common connection must be tied to the fan, uh, whatever is controlling the fan operation. So, you, you know, again, you have to look at that. But these are all things that you have to read that in the manual when you're going to do a two transformer system on there. So that would, that's, the, that's the thing I would, definitely, um, that I would definitely point that out on there. So, and again, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put a note on here um, as we're talking about this is common connection. Um, and I'm going to just say must identify um, which common to use. Um, and I'll put a note on there, you know, is it going to be the cooling transformer or heating? And you're going to have to figure that out. The only way, you know, to do this is, I would say, look at the manual. It might affect the operation of some of your other systems. And that's why I mentioned that. Uh, be a little bit careful on that. All right, let's talk colors now. So colors, um, typically, you know, what I usually ran into when I'm when I'm dealing with this is um, it, you're using whatever's left over. So you know, in most cases, you know, if you got enough conductors, they might give you a brown conductor. Um, if they don't give you, you know, if the brown isn't there, you know, it could even be a gray conductor. Um, I've had applications or it's a black conductor um, could even be blue if that's available and I, I think the point it would be um, you know oftentimes it's using you know what is left over typically um, that's normally what you would do You're using whatever's left over what's the remaining wire that's available to me is kind of the normal normal way to do that all right now, uh, one additional one I'm going to add here, and uh, I'll talk about some of these a little bit later, whoops, uh, is I'm going to list as OB. And um, the OB terminal on a lot of our new thermostats, it lists that. And I'm, I'm just going to put a note in there. This is really, that is going to be for my heat pump um, systems only. 
is the is the normal one and again we'll we'll deal with that and uh, get into that a little bit later on there so that's a little bit on that one all right so let's um there's just a couple little things that uh, i'm going to go through as as we um, identify this one here so i'm going to jump into the next page and um uh, and then I'll take a break here. And essentially the on this one, the first thing I wanted to hit up on a little bit on there is they, when I'm talking about these terminals, the RH and the RG um, and you know the RC and that. So for example, is when they basically have this jumper that I was referring to that's right there. So um, for example, the this particular uh, RHRC terminal that you're seeing here. I know this gets a little bit fuzzy in there. So that little jumper in there is connecting the RH and the RC. It's connecting whatever transformer system is going to supply it. So when you, um, oftentimes in our area, we will have, we will use what they call one transformer system. So maybe the furnace will supply the 24 volts. Now, if there is a an additional transformer or a separate cooling system, um, then this jumper would have to come out. So that's that's the only thing. So I would say, um, I'm going to make a note on here as we are doing this. There we go. I would say, you know, the um, jumper is intact for one transformer systems and it's important that you recognize that because it'll it will impact the operation of this unit so one transformer system or single transformer systems um, and I'll, I'll just put a note on there um, normally um, let's say powered from let's just say normally powered from the heating um, heat furnace in our climate which is the normal so that's the typical on there now, additionally, um, what I'm going to just put a note on here is, I'll just put a note, remove when using multiple or two transformer systems. And there again, so that's, you know, that's typically. Now, the beauty of this is, you know, some of our, our newer thermostats, we had to put a jumper in there. Some of our, our older ones, we had to make a jumper. Some of our, our brand new thermostats actually have a, a switch that you can move up or down to, to create the one or two transformer system. And um, so if you're using a one transformer, they'll have a switch that you would switch for that, similar to what we had, some of the things we had talked about earlier. So, you know, it's, it's very, um, you know, very important to recognize what that's for. What, you know, the thing that I, I think the point to, to look at that is, uh, is that when you're, when you've got the RC, RH jumper in here, what I want you to recognize how you are, what they're doing is they are connecting that, the RH and the RC into the, into the furnace or into the unit. Now, additionally, what I want to point out here is this. I'm going to circle this little area in here. Now, earlier, I had um, shown you an, an anticipator, and I wanted to show you, this is stage one heat right there, and this bottom one is stage two. And you're gonna notice when you look close at that wiring in here, and I'll zoom in a little bit on here, you'll notice how on a fall in temp, the way that symbol is drawn on here is on a fall in temp. So this is, let's say this is 24 volts, so when this gets colder, the temperature falls, that's when it makes the contact. And then it goes into the anticipator and, and then it'll go over to the arrow and of course complete the circuit on there. And that's what's going to W1 and W2. Now, in a, two in a dual circuit or a two stage system, I would say look very closely at the ampacity or the amperage of those two circuits of, of the T1 and T2 or the W1 and W2. So this, I would say, as far as the setting on that, 
I would say oftentimes, um, I would say either look um, at, um, I would say look at the notes from the manufacturer. Sometimes they'll put them in the wire, by the wiring diagram. Sometimes they'll put them in the install. There's a number of ways to, to look at on there. So be, just be, be aware of that, be cognizant of that. All right. And uh, the one on the, the bottom one on here, I just wanted to point this out. Here they're showing you um, that Q539. And uh, I'm just going to highlight this Q539A with a T87F. And that's, a, that's one of those. And they're, what they're showing you, and I just wanted to point out a couple of things here. That right there, that's essentially the mercury is what they're showing you. Whoops. That's the mercury. Now that mercury is swinging between either it's going to make contact here or it's going to make contact here. So obviously it's right now it's making contact with the one on the on the right side and the one on the left side it would make contact if um, Essentially, as that temperature would fall in the space, then it would make um, contact or warm up in that space. However, they're they're showing it in there. So, um, on a on a fall in, in temperature, it would indeed make this circuit, and then of course it would go in through the anticipator, and just like I talked about earlier, and then this would be adjusted according to that circuit amperage. Now, what I did want to also point out. So right now it's showing um, it kind of almost like a, having a, a cooling demand. And in this case, then the Y1 circuit has the complete circuit because of the mercury in there. And then it goes on to Y1. But I wanted to point this out. Notice how it shows you a fixed cooling anticipator. And that's nothing more than a resistor that's in parallel with the demand. So earlier I talked about when is in the circuit. It's when, when it's in the circuit is when there is no, uh, no demand. So in other words, when there would be either a heating call or there would be no cooling call, then that would be energized. So again, I'll just make a little quick note on that. It's, I'll just say it's energized without a cooling call. So that's generally, it's in parallel with the heating demand on there. And then all these other switches that they're showing in the bottom here, those are really what we call the heat cool selector switches. And then there's a fan on auto switch. And uh, that's another, another one of these things. So this image down in the bottom here is identifying a two transformer system. And uh, as I talked a little bit about, so for those of you that weren't really sure, what do you mean by a two transformer system? Um, this is uh, this will maybe share, shed a little bit of light on here. So in this example or this system, we're showing a heating transformer. So this would be provided in the appliance or as a separate transformer, and they're they're going to show um, they're just going to show the the RH and they're going to show a common connection um, accordingly. And then obviously uh, this this circuit here, the cooling transformer that they're showing, you'll notice how this goes to RC. And it would also take care of the G and the Y. And the reason for doing all three of those together is simply because that is what the fan is always needed in the cool in most of our cooling systems. So that's why if there, there's times where they may say the cooling transformer has to provide the common for the for the thermostat. Now, of course, this one is not an electronic one, um, as you would see on a more modern current thermostat. So Again, I want to point that out, that that's what, that's what a couple of those things had meant uh, related to that. So anyways, so that um, will conclude it up to page four and, um, of the thermostat application. So co lot, covered a lot of things, um, you know, numbers of conductors and what they're used for, minimum conductors, uh, typical, temper uh, typical colors of conductors, and some of those things as well as cycle rates. And, um, and then I will pause.